During last year's E3 2018, Microsoft announced that the next generation Xbox was in development and wanted to emphasize their commitment to gaming, announcing the acquisition of several new studios who would be creating exclusives for the company, basically shoring up one of the primary weaknesses they've had in this generation, namely lack of exclusives. So that was a great positive message, but we still had to wait 12 months to know exactly what the company were planning. So 12 months has come and gone, and at E3 2019 we learn many more details of Project Scarlet, the next generation Xbox, which will be the focus of this video. And also we have an absolute massive catalogue of games that we've seen from Microsoft. In fact, there were so many titles that Microsoft had to show, they opted to hold some back and keep them in reserve for the future. This is a luxury the company just haven't had in several years, and is definitely a very strong showing. So my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be analysing everything we know thus far about Microsoft's upcoming next generation console. Back in E3 2018, Microsoft announced that they were working on multiple new Xbox consoles. And indeed, in subsequent conversations following the conference, Spencer confirmed that this was the plan. During E3 2019, however, the conversation became focused on a single system, which led many to wonder if Microsoft had a change of heart. Microsoft not discussing a secondary system isn't a sure thing, though. It's possible that they just didn't want to give away too much information to competitors, or didn't want to risk mixing up marketing messages for the next generation console. Originally, the rumour had been that there'd be Lockhart, which would be the lower performing SKU, based on the Zen 2 CPU architecture and an RDNA based GPU, and then Anaconda, featuring the same basic components, albeit with the specs ramped up significantly. We'll drill down further into the components soon, but for now, you can think of this approach as much the same as Microsoft have now, with both the original Xbox One and the Xbox One X albeit this would be, of course, from launch. The newest report from Brad Sims on his YouTube channel, I'll link it in the video description, is that Lockhart is actually radically different from this first report, and will instead feature very little onboard processing. Essentially, it's powerful enough to handle things such as collision detection and a little of the in-game logic, but the heavy lifting, such as graphics, would instead have to be handled by the cloud, Microsoft's Project X Cloud to be exact. According to Microsoft's internal testing, and this is a rumour, this reduces latency and improves performance as well as lowering the bandwidth requirements of the service. So we now have three potentials for Microsoft's second console. The first is that it's completely canned. The second is it is still the lower end skew that I discussed earlier, so let's simplify things and say that it's aimed at 1080p, while Anaconda is aimed at 4K, with Anaconda being the console that Microsoft were discussing during the conference, and the final rumour, which tallies more up with what Brad is saying, that the console instead is very low performance device, unable to play games locally, but is developed for streaming. As developers will likely tell you, porting up a project is much easier than porting down. Or to put it another way, what sounds easier to you? Making a game like Doom 2016 with the Nintendo Switch in mind and then bringing it to another console, which is more powerful, or doing the reverse. Hint, the Switch first would be much easier. Let's for a moment assume that the PS5 is less capable than the highest performing Xbox SKU, and we don't know if that's the case, but we'll delve more into performance comparisons in just a moment, developers only have limited budgets, limited amount of human resources, as well as, of course, time. To this end, there is the possibility Microsoft were concerned that developers would simply optimise the games for the lowest end console. Then, whatever time they had left, they would spend a slightly tweak the version for Anaconda. Basically, Microsoft could have found themselves in a situation where neither of their consoles was getting the best performance or visuals possible, as well as frustrating developers and also giving Sony's console a bit of a leg up. I'm inclined to believe that xCloud will be how Microsoft choose to target gamers who are unwilling to plunk down the cash for a new console, 
particularly as the company are reportedly very happy with the performance of its service. They've also stated that emerging markets will be targeted via xCloud. So let's start things out with what's confirmed spec-wise as an overview before drilling down to the separate components. Microsoft have confirmed the inclusion of an AMD Zen 2 CPU, but didn't provide information such as the number of threads or cores, or indeed the clock frequency. The GPU was confirmed to be RDNA-based, and that hardware-based ray tracing was present, and also the other major announcement was that much like Sony, we would see a super fast storage device. They actually said that it's going to be around 40 times the performance compared to the older Xbox. Um, and also Microsoft have confirmed the presence of an optical drive as well. We'll start things with the SSD. And according to Microsoft, this is an exact quote, we've created a new generation of SSD we're actually using the SSD as virtual RAM, and we're seeing over 40 times the performance over the current generation. Those are bold claims, and match very much what Sony have done with the PlayStation 5, as they're pushing the abilities of the PS5 as well, and are using it to stream data very quickly into games. A Sony patent shows the potential for this to eliminate loading times for titles. All of this is exciting stuff. Most likely, it will be a drive that, at least in part, is similar to the next-generation high-performance NVMe drives for PC, but I don't think you're just going to be able to plonk in another drive, drive easily into your system. Most likely, it will be highly customized and integrated into the very heart of the console. From Microsoft's wording here, the drive isn't just about pulling data as you're loading into the next part of the game, such as a new map but it will also act as a separate pool of RAM, albeit considerably slower, of course, than, let's say, the GDDR6 memory on the system. The drive will clearly not be as fast as main system memory, but it will still provide quite a lot of performance. Next-generation NVMe drives have around 4 gigabytes per second for sequential writes and best-case scenarios. So even if the consoles are two times the speed, of the current generation, this is still much slower than RAM, but should provide some interesting options for developers. What is the point here is that it's sufficient performance to swap data in and out of very fast, and can basically be used as extremely advanced virtual memory. This has the obvious benefit of reducing the need for a radical increase in the amount of system memory. There's also been a lot of discussion online of the potential for two separate chips for both the CPU and the GPU, an approach Microsoft have taken before with the Xbox 360, which also used unified memory, and also the original Xbox. But given the shots of the console we've seen in the trailer, we'll analyse those further in just a moment, it does look unlikely. Furthermore, AMD basically confirmed a SOC for Sony in E3 2019's Next Horizon event, so the chance is reasonable that Microsoft would have done a similar thing. But of course, it's not 100% confirmed. But let's dig into the respective component choices. Microsoft confirmed that Scarlet would be using Zen 2, and it's a logical choice by the company and represents a substantial increase in processor horsepower compared to even the Xbox One X. The X uses an AMD Jaguar-based processor, clocked at 2.3 GHz, but still uses the same 8-core configuration as the 2013 base model. But Microsoft did include a number of tweaks and customizations for the implementation of Jaguar for the Xbox One X, and word is that they're taking a similar approach to the Zen 2 CPU cores found in Scarlet. Microsoft did not confirm the number of processor cores, which is unlike Sony, who previously confirmed during the Wired interview that we will expect 8 CPU cores and 16 threads, because we do know that Zen 2 is capable of uh, SMT, simultaneous multi-threading. Likely we'll see the same number of CPU cores for Microsoft console as well. And given a chiplet of Zen 2 contains 8 CPU cores across two 
different CCXs, it would make the most sense. And if you're yet to watch the All You Need To Know About Ryzen 3000 video on this channel, I'd suggest you do so if you're not super familiar with the Zen 2 architecture. As a quick overview, each of the two Zen 2 CCXs contained inside the chiplet contains 16 megabytes of its own level 3 cache, meaning the full chiplet would contain a grand total of 32 megabytes, with 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache per core, and 32 kilobytes of level 1 instruction cache, as well as 32 kilobytes of data cache. In my All You Need To Know video, I also predicted that I feel that the amount of level 3 cache will be reduced for the consoles, but this is not based on insider information, just a gut feeling. The Zen 2 CCX is 31mm squared, and the chiplet is 74mm squared. To put this into some context, the Zen chips on the 12nm process were 44mm squared for the cores and 16mm squared for the level 3 cache, although the cache was only 8 megabytes compared to Zen 2 16. So, the 31.3mm squared for both the level 3 cache as well as the CCX's CPU cores, we can almost expect a lot of the size to simply be taken up by the level 3 cache, so halving it may be the best solution. How much impact they would have on performance is the big question, but it would save potentially enough die space to use for other things, such as trading off for more space for GPU performance, which could potentially be a great trade-off. Jim and Phil Spencer has mentioned that higher frame rates are a target for the next generation Xbox device, and during the E3 press briefing, the PR video claimed frame rates of up to 120 frames per second, we can imagine that the CPU will be of critical importance for this. It will be interesting to see how the cores are segmented for both OS and system duties, plus of course games. The 2013 launch of both Sony and Microsoft systems allocated two of the eight AMD Jaguar cores to the operating system functionality. But... Both Sony and Microsoft reduced this and left it down to developers to siphon off some of the 7th CPU core towards game logic. I actually went much deeper into this in videos of the time, so you can search for that on the channel if you so desire. I'll try to remember as well to link it in the description of this video. So, what does all of this mean? Well, we're left with a CPU that will likely run at at least twice the clock frequency, ish anyway, compared to the base model systems of 2013, while simultaneously offering 32 instructions per clock versus 8 of the Jaguar, and the bottom line is basically the CPU cores inside Zen 2 are going to be faster, more efficient, and considerably more capable than the low power cores found in either Sony or Microsoft's last console. The GPU for the next generation systems will be very interesting from a marketing standpoint, because both Sony and Microsoft were pushing TFLOPS comparisons hard for the previous generation. Microsoft's Xbox One X holds the current crown for consoles at 6 teraflops, which is pretty impressive given the form factor, but it does use a much older architecture than what we see from Vega, let alone the soon-to-be-released Nave GPUs, which are featured in the RX 5700 series. Pure TFLOP comparisons become meaningless when you're dealing with an entirely different GPU architecture, and we see AMD themselves claim that clock for clock, that is the same number of compute units and the clock frequency, that the RDNA architecture is about 25% faster than Vega. And once again, Vega is much newer than the architecture found in the Xbox One X. To compare TFLOPs against such radically different chips isn't really possible, it's like saying that a desktop Q6600 from Intel running at 4GHz would perform the same as a modern-day Intel quad-core chip with the same clock frequency, even if hyper-threading was disabled for the modern-day chip. The IPC and efficiency of the newer chip would simply destroy the old Q6600. TFLOMPS for this generation of consoles has been a bit like the Bit Wars back in the late 90s. I suspect this is one reason Microsoft chose to highlight figures such as four times the performance of the Xbox One X, 
or 40 times the drive performance. We can pretty much be certain that a GPU hitting 24 teraflops is not exactly likely, and Microsoft did clarify that the 4 times figure is a combination of different factors that are used to determine the metric, but they were elusive as to exactly what those figures were. We'll get more into this in a moment though. Okay, so let's talk about the actual technical details then. As mentioned earlier, RDNA is significantly more efficient than previous AMD architectures, and one of the keys to improvements is the smarter compute unit design. Each CU is technically still comprised of 64 shaders, but the compute unit itself is considerably more complicated and smarter than what was seen previously from AMD's older architectures. The new CU doubles the instruction rates of older GCN architectures, i.e. the architectures we've seen in Sony and Microsoft's last consoles, and also doubles the number of scalar units and schedulers to achieve this. I've talked about the design more in depth in the past, and I'll also be doing a deeper breakdown of RDNA soon, because this video is already going to end up much longer than I'd intended, so I want to just focus on key points here so we're all on the same page. Previously, we saw a wavefront, just think of wavefront as a set of instructions, was 64 threads wide, but RDNA changes this natively to only 32 threads wide. This is combined with simultaneously changing the number of SIMD slots, which were 16 and now they have bought, been bought up to SIMD32. So essentially this means that the wavefront size matches the size of the SIMD and can be executed in a single clock cycle. So again, while there are 64 shaders per compute unit technically, these shaders are broken down into groups of 32 shaders. Or to put it in a more accurate and AMD's own lingo, it means that we have a dual compute unit design. Basically, they're smarter and much more complicated than AMD's older GCN design. There was also significant tweaks and changes to the key aspects of the GPU, including the caching system and also delta color compression. RDNA shaders can both read and write color compressed data, and the display unit can also read this compressed data that's held in the frame buffer without needing to decompress it first. Because we see RDNA put out 25% more work, on average gaming workloads compared to Vega, and remember, Vega once again is a considerably more ar uh, newer architecture compared to what we saw in the original Xbox One console or the Xbox One X, raw T-flop comparisons become a bit meaningless. Microsoft have also confirmed hardware-based ray tracing support. On looking at AMD's own roadmap, there are a few clues as to this. In fact, in an exclusive interview back in late March, I revealed a source had told me that the next generation Nave architecture, as it wasn't known as RDNA back then, would support ray tracing and would debut in 2020. And lo and behold, in Ray Tracing Vision, the current RDNA architecture is nope to hardware accelerated RT, but the next generation RDNA architecture does feature ray tracing and it launches next year. It wouldn't be a big leap to assume, therefore, that Microsoft Scarlet would use some custom variant of this next-generation RDNA GPU. And if it does, we can also expect that there will be some tweaks to the underlying architecture to further improve the performance of the shaders. Indeed, in the same exclusive as the ray tracing video, I'd revealed that Nave had the goals of fixing the issues we saw with older GCN architectures, namely things such as geometry, performance, and pixel pushing power. And we can assume that this is going to be a trend that AMD continues with, with the next generation architecture. And there's also patents that AMD have filed themselves. Essentially, it shows a hybrid hardware and software solution for ray tracing. NVIDIA's solution with its own ray tracing core is pretty powerful, but it does have some drawbacks. And one of them is that programming of RTX is going to work on NVIDIA hardware only. Given AMD have pushed the open standards, especially for ray tracing, they are manufacturing GPUs for both consoles and PCs. Therefore, logically you can say that it's in their best interest to have a portability for developers, because code would work much more easily between PC and consoles. 
As for Microsoft, well, they developed DXR, DirectX Ray Tracing, which works in conjunction with DirectX 12 as an API specifically designed for ray tracing. Microsoft have no shortage of ray tracing patents of their own, and goodness knows how many they've filed which have not been published to the general public yet. Microsoft being the creator of both the Xbox platform and creators of Windows is clearly going to incentivize them to make ray tracing as open as possible between both PC and Xbox as well. A hybrid solution, therefore, would make sense from the perspective of matching up with both companies' goals and would solve another big quandary we've had with ray tracing in consoles, die space. Some may take a die size comparisons between Turing and Pascal shaders as a comparison here, but honestly, it's not a very fair assessment because the Turing architecture, even if you discount ray tracing, is a significant departure from Pascal. Don't forget... Turing is essentially a slightly tweaked version of Volta. NVIDIA have allowed concurrent execution of Intergen FP32 instructions, beefed up the amount of chip cache rather significantly, and a plethora of other changes which, quite frankly, don't fall inside the remit of this video to cover. Though the dedicated ray tracing cores and tensor cores do eat up die space, NVIDIA have essentially taken the approach of having ray tracing do two tasks. They accelerate both bounding volume hierarchy, BVH traversal, as well as ray slash triangle intersection testing, also known as ray casting functions. BVH is a very complex topic and would eat up a lot of discussion time to go in depth with in this video, but I have had a deeper interview with NVIDIA regarding this, so you can check it out on the channel. And I've also done my own share of breakdowns as well. But the gist of it is, is the BVH's job is to figure out which objects in a scene get hit with a ray when it's cast into the scene. It does this by essentially using boxes, which subsequently have further boxes inside of them, breaking a scene down into a set of objects. So basically it drills down into these objects until it selects the right one, from the largest box to smaller and smaller until it becomes as accurate as possible and selects the right one. And of course, this is more complicated and takes longer with more complicated and higher resolution scenes. With the second generation of RDNA, this is handled a bit differently and the GPU uses Intersect Engine to schedule these instructions directly as compute shaders on the CU of the GPU. Basically, it passes the data through the texture units of the GPU. Unfortunately, the nitty-gritty of how this works isn't particularly explicit due to the pattern, and basically we don't even know how it affects performance compared to, let's say, standard rasterization, what drawbacks, if any, there are, and also how this pattern is applicable to either Xbox Scarlet or the PlayStation 5. It's possible that this pattern has nothing to do with either console and both Sony and Microsoft have gone their own way or it's possible that this pattern is a very early implementation and there is actually some significant differences after all. Sony and Microsoft aren't exactly strangers to customising the GPU. What we can say is though that based upon the APU that we've seen in the Scarlet teaser which debuted at E3 the APU looks slightly under 400 mm squared, and shout outs to all of the people who have emailed me in links to the measurements. The 2013 Xbox used TSMC's 28nm process and weighed in around 363 mm squared. Thanks, by the way, in no small part to the hefty amount of space eaten up by the 32 megabytes of ES RAM. The Xbox One X. APU came in at 360 mm squared, but did so using TSMC's 16 mm process. The Scorpio engine, which was the heart of the Xbox One X, we saw the ES RAM gone, and therefore the memory space, which was ES RAM, was now uh, actually linked to GDDR5 instead. It's mapped to a portion of GDDR5. So that space was occupied instead by a large number of compute units, 
What we can guess, therefore, is that Xbox Scarlet uses eight CPU cores for Zen 2, and as we've discussed earlier, the current 7nm chip, that which is eight CPU cores over two CCXs, as well as a full complement of 32 megabytes of level 3 cache, is 74mm squared. And as you might recall, I mentioned that a lot of that space is probably taken up by level 3 cache. So if Microsoft kept kept the cache size as is, it'll be 74 mm squared, and if they trimmed it down to 16 megabytes, which would mean 8 megabytes per CCX, that we could see that size fall to let's just call it 60 mm squared to be quite conservative. This is all assuming there are no other tweaks to the silicon that would significantly alter the size of the chip, and this is possibly for straight up performance reasons or potentially something to do with let's say backwards compatibility. Given the die of the RDNA based RX 5700 XT is 251 mm squared, though of course this is assuming a full die, there are some things that maybe Microsoft would opt to cut out of the GPU for a console, we can conservatively just say that 8 CPU cores and 40 CU would be ballpark low 300 mm squared region. And this is, of course, left with questions such as memory controls and I.O. Don't forget, all of this is a separate die for Matisse. I do wonder, therefore, if Microsoft would go with a similar strategy for the next generation Xbox. Our I.O. controller built on the same 12 nm process for Matisse and other Zen 2-like components. We couldn't see it though in the teaser trailer, but then the chip itself didn't even look exactly functional, it looked suspiciously clean of the surface components. It isn't therefore impossible to assume that we could see mid-40s for the CU count, though if the die we're seeing here is accurate in terms of size, it's very unlikely we'll see an APU that features more than mid-high to high 40s in terms of compute units. In terms of frequency though, we did see that the APU known as Gonzalo, which we believe is a variant of the PS5 test APU, its GPU is running at 1800 MHz. Though something to note here, the RX 5700 XT has three clock frequencies reported. The first is a base frequency, and we also have two further frequencies. 1905 for its boost clock, which is the typical max frequency that the GPU will reach. And a third figure, game clock, which in the case of the 5700 XT is 1755 megahertz. According to AMD, this is the figure that the GPU will typically reach under average gaming conditions, though as we all know, these figures fluctuate based upon temperature and power conditions. With consoles, flexible clock frequencies aren't exactly what's best for developers. An exception to this would be the switch when it's either docked or in portable mode. Instead, frequencies generally remain constant unless the unit is in danger of overheating slash damage. It's a little suspicious that we'll see a retail console hit 1800 MHz because of the cooling thing, but it's also power consumption. Then again, it's possible Microsoft could employ a robust cooling solution, similar to the Xbox One X, or they may choose to lower clock frequencies, or simply go wider and run more compute units at a lower clock speed. The Xbox One X ran 40 compute units at 1172 MHz, which was barely the frequency needed to squeak by Microsoft's 6 teraflop barrier. You can see a table here which compares the TFLOP performance of the GPU with different uh, compute unit configurations as well as clock frequencies. A GPU that is around 10 teraflops in range, but considerably more efficient than the current systems and supports baked in ray tracing, to be honest, is very exciting, especially with a high performance CPU to enable high frame rates. Unfortunately, the memory configuration leaves us with a lot of speculation because we don't have an awful lot to go on. During the video presentation, Microsoft did not reveal the entire area around the chip. And once again, that's even assuming the chip was real and the components just simply weren't fabricated 
for this video, and even if they weren't just fabricated for the video, even represent the close to final design. Instead, heavy uses of angles and blurring of background elements essentially means that a lot of the configuration is left down to our imagination. Microsoft are using GDDR6 memory, which isn't surprising for the console. And if you pause the video at the right time, you can just about make out some of the part numbers, which of course you can Google. We see one part is 325BC-HC14, and the second is 325BM-HC14. The HC14 part is the easy bit. It confirms the modules are 14 Gbps. Though, honestly, this would be one of the easier things Microsoft could change in the final configuration. Unfortunately, the other two mod parts of the model names add to the confusion. 325BC and 325BM. These actually correspond to totally different memory sizes. One is one gigabyte, and the other is two gigabytes. Definitely this is a head scratcher because we're left now with several potential possibilities. And I don't think anyone outside of Microsoft or the developers they've entrusted really knows the answer to this one. The first option is that this mock-up isn't accurate at all. And they basically just decided to throw chips onto a PCB that were lying around. As some PR guy said to the engineer, hey, um, we need to prepare something for E3, and they just basically soldered whatever they had on hand. So that's one potential possibility. The second potential is that the chips are purposefully chosen as a mixture, so that you and I are asking questions like this. Microsoft revealed all, basically, anyway, with the Xbox One X video, as we could see the memory configurations, and we could easily figure out what specifications the system had. So now we, and probably more importantly their rivals, are left thinking, what the hell? There's also a key difference though between the Xbox One X and Scarlet, and that is that Sony already had revealed the hand with the PS4 Pro, and Microsoft were keen to push hype into their system, being more powerful than Sony's. Spencer himself confirmed that he's not 100% confident that Microsoft will end up with a beefy machine, but, of course, it's his goal. And also confirmed that they are purposefully holding back information to not give Sony an upper hand. The other possibility we have is a split memory system, which could potentially mean a pool of memory for both the CPU as well as GPU. Although we can imagine there would be still some type of unified memory access, given AMD's Infinity Fabric as well as other technology, there's a very good chance that this would be the case. If it is a split bus, though, and separate memory pools, it'll be interesting to see how Microsoft divide this memory up, and which memory pool is what size, and what the total bandwidth and clock configurations are. So during the discussion of SSDs, the engineer specifically stated that it was over 40 times the performance of Xbox One X Drive, and it could be used as virtual memory for the console. It's therefore possible that the amount of memory won't need to balloon massively compared to the previous generation. So we won't need to see a board laden with, let's say, 24 gigabytes of RAM, and Microsoft instead rely more on the drive to push data to and from the system as required. Of course, Windows-based machines, as well as other operating systems, do that now. If your physical RAM gets filled up, your system will push stuff onto the system drive as virtual memory. PCs now, of course, especially for the boot drive, have largely transitioned to SSDs, so having your system run short of RAM doesn't make swapping to inactive applications in a low memory environment as painful as it did, say, 10 years ago, as we waited for the old hard drive to spin back up. And also, don't forget AMD's experiments. The Radeon SSG solid state graphics which houses 16 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory too and a vega gpu with 64 compute units but also a two terabyte ssd used for caching this design was used to tear through 8k video playback as well as content creation but we can imagine a similar technology in microsoft games consoles albeit of course for games indeed there are several patents that have been discovered to show Sony 
actively attempting to make loading screens a thing of the past, plus various demos. I get the feeling, though, that such a critical technology would be found on Microsoft's console as well. But, hey, I could be wrong on that. Microsoft have also used several board shots which are almost 100% likely to be the Xbox One X motherboard and have nothing at all to do with the next generation console and are either just red herrings or are there just to make it look good. Each generation of consoles has its own unique challenges. With the previous generation, Generation 8, the biggest obstacle was the low power Jaguar cores inside the systems. I'll be putting out a video retrospective on that soon enough but if you take a look at the systems, they were very much GPU heavy, which is one of the reasons we saw the push towards GPU compute for the systems. From generation 7 to 8 though, we also saw a massive increase in the amount of memory. 16 times, 512 megabytes for the Xbox 360, and a similar amount for the PS3, albeit with the PS3 split into two separate memory pools. This is very much different from the Xbox One and the PS4 base machines which have 8 gigabytes of memory. Sony pushed the PS4 as the most powerful console back in 2013, which Microsoft was happy to reverse roles with in 2017, with the launch of the Xbox One X. But this generation will be different, and for example let's say that the final consoles feature GPUs which put out raw T-flops between 9 and 11 T-flops. That doesn't sound that impressive compared to the Xbox One X and X6 T-flops, but arguably this next generation will be the first generation of consoles to see potentially have the full package, with a fast GPU and CPU, lots of RAM, and a fast drive to be able to provide rapid access to data. We've seen tantalizing glimpses of what's possible from Sony's Spider-Man demo, running on an early PS5 dev kit, and Microsoft have showed a little bit of Halo Infinite, albeit not a live demo, which was a shame. Also, if there was ray tracing in the Halo Infinite demo, the implementation was very subtle, but perhaps they're deliberately holding that back or just not implemented it yet. What was very evident, though, was the raw level of detail in the background environment textures compared to previous Halo titles. Even when Master Chief was first dropped uh, after his suit was uh, resurrected, let's call it, we saw the environment react subtly. Lighter objects jostled around, and this is possibly an indication of what the next generation is going to bring. More immersive physics, all possible because of the higher performing CPU, better AI, and larger game environments. If you are a PC gamer, there's a chance that you've listened to this and thinking that this just sounds an awfully lot like a current medium to high spec PC. And honestly, largely you'd be right. In 18 months, this hardware will be very likely easily achievable in a similar configuration for desktop. But with the customizations and fixed hardware, the potential for developers is extremely interesting, particularly with a super fast SSD and the potential that it brings. It'll be interesting to see what impact that makes for PC games as well. Microsoft and Sony will definitely be pushing hardware as much as possible, but the messaging will be very interesting. And now that Microsoft have seemingly abandoned Lockhart, the lower end SKU, it's gonna be curious what price Microsoft ends up targeting. With all of that said though, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then definitely consider subscribing for much more content similar to this. You can also find us on social media, which of course will be linked in the description of this very video. So go ahead and follow us on that if you so desire. You can also find us on some Amazon affiliate links, which of course will be found in the video description. And if you choose to, you can also support us on Patreon, which you guessed it, is also found on the video description. Don't feel you have to, but if you choose to, that would be greatly appreciated. With all of that said though, take care of yourselves, have a great day, bye for now.